Welcome to the first part of our comprehensive review on the gastrointestinal tract. Eosinophilic esophagitis is a condition often seen in young adults with symptoms like food impaction or dysphagia. It's commonly associated with atopic conditions such as asthma and eczema. Diagnosis involves endoscopy to identify rings and linear furrows, followed by biopsy which might have more than 15 eosinophils per field. Treatment includes trial of PPIs, first and dietary changes. Medical management includes oral corticosteroids like PO butasonide pills. Schatzky ring is characterized by intermittent solid food dysphagia and is often linked with hiatal hernia. Diagnosis is typically done through a barium swallow, especially in the absence of alarm symptoms. It's crucial to rule out eosinophilic esophagitis in cases of recurrent rings, with treatment focusing on PPI for acid suppression and esophageal dilation. Zenker diverticulum is a false diverticulum occurring in the posterior hypopharynx, mostly affecting the elderly. Symptoms include dysphagia, regurgitation, and foul breath. Diagnosis is through a barium swallow, and there's a risk of aspiration pneumonia due to chronic and progressive symptoms. Esophagitis in HIV patients can be caused by candida, which presents often with oral thrush and pain on swallowing. We see white plague on endoscopy, with pseudohyphae on biopsy, and it need to be treated with oral fluconazole, not just swish and swallow. Second is cytomegalovirus, which cause odinophagia as well without oral lesion, and has linear sharply demarcated ulcers in distal esophagus with intranuclear inclusion and treated with IV gansaclovir. Herpes simplex virus presents with abrupt oral lesion and has shallow, well-circumscribed ulcers. Biopsy has positive HSV culture on staining. Treatment with acyclovir. In patients with Boerhaave's upper esophageal spontaneous rupture, next step, even after CXR showed pneumomediastinum, would be chest CT or esophagram with gastrographin to see if perforation is contained or not. Sometimes, left-sided pleural effusion that developed acutely and is increasing with hemodynamic instability can indicate Boerhaave. Mallory Weiss occurs at the gastroesophageal junction due to a sudden increase in intra-abdominal pressure from forceful retching or vomiting. It often presents with hematemesis, especially in individuals with recent alcohol use or eating disorders. Diagnosis is confirmed via upper endoscopy, which is the preferred diagnostic tool. In most cases, the bleeding is self-limited and resolves spontaneously within 24 to 48 hours. However, if active bleeding persists, endoscopic therapy is required and may include epinephrine injection, cautery, or hemoclip application to achieve hemostasis. Caustic esophageal injuries like those from bleach ingestion require prompt imaging to rule out perforation. If stable, endoscopy within 24 hours is recommended. Long-term cancer screening is advised due to the risk of necrosis. If a patient over 60 has GERD that's not relieved by over-the-counter meds, you should proceed with endoscopy. However, if the patient is under 60 without alarm features, a trial of PPI is reasonable. For patients with GERD that's uncontrolled on once-daily PPI, increase to twice-daily dosing if there are no alarm symptoms. In that case, an EGD may not be necessary. For young patients with dyspepsia, test for H. pylori via stool antigen or breath test before starting PPI therapy. Now, pseudoachalasia should be evaluated with endoscopy after a bird beak appearance is seen on barium swallow, especially if the patient is over 60, the symptoms have been present for less than six months, or there's acute weight loss. Barrett's esophagus looks red and beefy due to intestinal metaplasia with goblet cells replacing the normal squamous epithelium. It's diagnosed on screening upper GI endoscopy, especially in patients with chronic GERD. Once Barrett's is identified, the next step depends on the presence and grade of dysplasia. If there's no dysplasia, manage with PPI and repeat endoscopy every three to five years. If it's low-grade dysplasia, treat with PPI and either surveillance or proceed with endoscopic eradication, monitoring every six to 12 months. If there's high-grade dysplasia, the recommendation is PPI and endoscopic eradication. For all patients with peptic ulcer disease or GI bleeding, you should perform an endoscopic biopsy to test for H. pylori. Be aware that false negative results can occur, especially if the patient has active GI bleeding or is on PPIs, bismuth, or antibiotics.
If the biopsy comes back negative, confirm the diagnosis with a urea breath test or stool antigen test. These should ideally be done after stopping PPI for one to two weeks if it's safe. And finally, empiric treatment of H. pylori is no longer recommended in developed countries. Diagnosis should be confirmed before starting therapy. Testing to confirm H. pylori eradication, done more than four weeks after initial therapy, can be considered in all patients, but it's especially recommended in those with persistent symptoms or with a history of H. pylori-associated ulcers, gastric malt lymphoma, or resected early gastric cancer. Eradication is usually checked with a urea breath test, fecal antigen test, or sometimes repeat endoscopy. Keep in mind, H. pylori serology is not helpful to distinguish between active and past infection. And importantly, if the urea breath test or fecal antigen test is still positive, the next step is to start quadruple therapy. For most patients, the first-line regimen is standard triple therapy, CAP, clarithromycin, amoxicillin, and a PPI for 14 days. If the patient has a penicillin allergy, we switch to modified triple therapy, CMP, clarithromycin, metronidazole, and a PPI for 14 days. However, in cases of high macrolide or metronidazole resistance, or if there's prior treatment failure, use quadruple therapy, also called BMT, PPI, bismuth, metronidazole, and tetracycline for 10 to 14 days. In a patient presenting with an acute upper GI bleed, initial management involves resuscitation and performing endoscopy within 24 hours. Following endoscopy, ulcers are stratified into three risk categories. First is high-risk ulcers. These include active bleeding, non-bleeding visible vessel or adherent clot. Management includes endoscopic hemostasis, intravenous proton pump inhibitor, clear liquid diet for two days. Testing and treating Helicobacter pylori patients with high-risk ulcers should be hospitalized for at least three days, and upon discharge, prescribed twice-daily PPI for two weeks, then switch to daily dosing. Patients with intermediate-risk ulcers, identified by a flat pigmented spot, are managed with once-daily oral proton pump inhibitor, allowing clear liquids for one day and eradicating Helicobacter pylori if present. These patients should be hospitalized for one to two days for monitoring and stabilization. Patients with low-risk GI bleed ulcers with clean base can often be discharged on daily PPI if able to tolerate regular diet. When a variceal hemorrhage is suspected, place two large-bore IV catheters and begin volume resuscitation, IV octreotide, antibiotics, and perform urgent endoscopic therapy of esophageal varices based on response to endoscopy. 1. No further bleeding. Initiate secondary prophylaxis with non-selective V-blocker and endoscopic band ligation in 1 to 2 weeks. Second, with continued bleeding, we need to perform balloon tamponade, which is a temporary measure, and then, in cases of early re-bleeding, we need to perform repeat endoscopic therapy and consider tips or shunt surgery if bleeding continues. Given that blood transfusions can cause volume overload with increased portal pressure, i.e. worsened bleeding, they are usually reserved for patients with a hemoglobin of less than 7 GRDL, continuous bleeding, or unstable coronary artery disease. Beta blockers are only used if varices are bleeding. If varices are present but not bleeding, we do not use beta blockers. Annual EGD is recommended for all cases of cirrhosis or bleeding varices, except in very low-risk cases such as compensated cirrhosis without varices. All patients with cirrhosis regardless of etiology, should undergo non-urgent surveillance for hepatocellular carcinoma with ultrasound every six months. Hepatopulmonary syndrome is a condition seen in patients with liver disease that leads to abnormal oxygenation due to intrapulmonary vascular dilations. Clinically, patients typically present with dyspnea that is worse when in an upright position, a phenomenon known as platypnea. In parallel, they experience worsening hypoxemia when standing, referred to as orthodeoxia. These positional symptoms are hallmark features and should raise suspicion for the diagnosis. To confirm the diagnosis, a contrast-enhanced echocardiography, also known as a bubble study, is performed. This test detects the delayed appearance of microbubbles in the left atrium after intravenous injection, typically appearing after more than three to six cardiac cycles. 
indicating intrapulmonary shunting, the physiological hallmark of the syndrome. Currently, the definitive treatment for hepatopulmonary syndrome is liver transplantation, which can reverse the underlying pathology and improve oxygenation over time. The evaluation of acidic fluid begins with identifying signs of infection or inflammation. In step one, if the total leukocyte count is greater than 500 palm 3 or the neutrophil count is greater than 250 mm3, this suggests a possible infectious or inflammatory process, such as spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. In such cases, additional diagnostic tests such as culture, cytology, or amylase levels should be performed to identify the underlying cause. Step 2 involves calculating the serum acyte's albumin gradient, SAG. A SAG 1.1 GDL indicates the presence of portal hypertension commonly associated with conditions like cirrhosis, cardiac ascites from right heart failure, or Boud-Chiari syndrome, hepatic vein thrombosis. Conversely, a SOG 1.1 GDL suggests non-portal hypertensive causes, such as nephrotic syndrome, malignancy, tuberculosis, or pancreatitis. In Step 3, the total protein concentration in the acidic fluid is measured. In cirrhosis and nephrotic syndrome, the protein level is typically less than 2.5 GDRSDL, reflecting low protein states due to impaired synthesis or increased losses. Alcoholic hepatitis. Check AST-ALT ratio as the first step. In questions, we can't rule in fatty liver or other hepatitis before checking hepatitis B and C serologies. In cases of hemochromatosis, transfer and saturation is usually above 50%. For questions, to diagnose Gilbert syndrome, it is sufficient to repeat liver function tests, LFTs, in six weeks, confirming isolated elevation of indirect bilirubin in the absence of elevated transaminases or hemolysis. Genetic testing for UGT1A1 mutations is not routinely required and is typically reserved for unclear or atypical cases. Autoimmune hepatitis is characterized by specific seromarkers such as ANA, anti-smooth muscle AB, LKM1, and LC1. Patients may experience small joint arthralgias and other autoimmune issues. Treatment typically involves steroids, with or without azathioprine or 6-mercaptopurin. Bud-Chiari syndrome predominantly affects females aged 30 to 40, especially those on oral contraceptives or during pregnancy. Other risk factors include MPNs, APLS, protein CES deficiency, Factor V Leiden mutation, and PNH. Symptoms include abdominal pain, ascites, and jaundice, with elevated SOG of more than 1.1 indicating thrombosis. Diagnosis is confirmed through Doppler or venography. Primary biliary cholangitis or B positive. So occurs in middle-aged women. AMA is the antibody and associated with autoimmune issues B positive. So good response to medical treatment. Think primary biliary cholangitis in middle-aged female with fatigue and itching. Symptoms include fatigue, pruritus, and skin hyperpigmentation, or xanthelasma, with lab findings showing elevated ALP and GGT. Treatment involves ursodeoxycholic acid, which leads to slow progression. Cholestyramine is used in pruritic and possibly liver transplant in advanced cases. We also need to monitor for complications including osteoporosis, fat-soluble vitamin deficiency, cirrhosis, or portal hypertension. Primary sclerosing cholangitis. Mnemonic to remember is UC sexy smooth asymptomatic malignant males. So it's associated with ulcerative colitis and presents with sexy sclerosing strictures resembling beads on a string with onion skin appearance. It may involve anti-smooth muscle ab and pansa. Patients often experience jaundice, fatigue, and pruritus. Malignant transformation requires MRCP for diagnosis and colonoscopy is needed for cancer screening. Liver transplant is the only treatment option. Acute hepatitis B viral, HBV infection, may be associated with serum sickness-like syndrome, fever, symmetric polyarthritis, and urticarial skin lesions without mucosal involvement. Diagnosis is confirmed by the presence of hepatitis B surface antigen. The rash and joint symptoms often resolve within two to three weeks, followed by development of the ectric phase of HBV infection. 
treatment is usually supportive. Wilson's disease is an autosomal recessive disorder that should be considered in young patients with liver failure and neurological or psychiatric symptoms. Low seriloplasmin and kaiser fleischer rings on eye slit exam are diagnostic indicators. It's important to screen siblings of affected individuals with genetic testing or copper studies. Gastric outlet obstruction presents with early satiety, postprandial reflux, nausea, vomiting, and a succession splash on examination. Patients should be evaluated for mechanical or mucosal causes with an upper endoscopy, especially those with risk factors like NSAID use. Endoscopy is crucial for further imaging if needed. Gastronoma, or Zollinger-Ellison syndrome, should be suspected with recurrent unusual ulcers and diarrhea, especially if refractory to PPIs. It's associated with MEN1. Serum gastrin levels should be checked before ulcer biopsy if gastrin level is less than 110, we need to do biopsy. If it's between 110 to 1,000, we need to do secretin stimulation test. If gastrin is above 1,000, we can confirm with gastric pH, which is usually less than 4 when patient is off PPI for a week at least. No need for biopsy. Dumping syndrome occurs post-bariatric surgery, with early dumping syndrome with abdominal pain, nasuia, and diarrhea appearing 15 to 30 minutes after meals. Late symptoms include dizziness and confusion due to reactive hypoglycemia in two to three hours. Management involves small, frequent meals with complex carbohydrates and high-fiber, protein-rich foods. Common side effects of bariatric surgery include stomal stenosis, gastrojejunal, dumping syndrome, and cholelithiasis. Thank you for your attention throughout this presentation.